please your book of Second Kings. Second Kings chapter number 7. Find your place in the Word of God. We'll stand together and read and then bring the message I believe the Lord would have me to in the service tonight. It is a real honor for me to get more acquainted with your pastor and with you on our journey. That way I don't have to fool with getting acquainted with you in heaven. Amen. But I appreciate so much the ministry God has given to this church and this preacher, uh, both here and then with your outreach. It'll be amazing at the judgment seat of Christ. I want to make a statement, preacher. I, I, there are not many Baptist preachers say what I'm fixing to say, and I don't say that to make me outstanding. But I look forward to the judgment seat of Christ. There is an element of it I dread. I surely have not been all I need to be. But to see what, can I say it this way? To see what God has done with what we have done. And I'm not robbing God of the glory. But he does use human vessels. Amen. There'll be so many things at the judgment seat of Christ that we knew nothing about. We learned of a few of them. Years ago in 1967, I was 25 years old. Vietnam War was raging. And uh, I wrote a little gospel track. If you remember, if you're old enough to remember that, they were burning the campuses, burning the villages, and marching in the streets. We saw a little of that last summer or two summers ago. And God moved on my heart. And I wrote a gospel track entitled, You Want Peace. Well, the war ended. I thought the track ended, so I let it die. I quit printing it. And after some years, God began to deal with my heart about putting it back into print. And so I did. I gave it to Rock of Ages and three or four different uh, companies like that printed it, printing ministries. One of those tracks made it to Nigeria. A man read it and was saved. 25 years after I had written the track, 27 years, I got a letter from a preacher in Nigeria. And it said to know that a man could have and live in peace with God was too much to keep to myself. So I took the track, I went to the market, I went to the schools and other places there. And to make a long story short, we've got a church going now. Since you're our father in the faith, we want you to come and preach our first crusade. Now, I couldn't go. But I did discover they were having a battle with the charismatics trying to move in. And so I sent him my book on the Holy Spirit, my book on the Baptist doctrine, Bible doctrines rather. And uh, they talked through that and with one vote became an independent Baptist church. We stayed in contact somewhat through the years since 1995. And I think the fellow has no idea that there's a time difference between Africa and America. They're six hours ahead of us, so 10 o'clock for him on any morning is 4 o'clock here. I don't think he really realizes that phones work because he yells in the phone where I can hear him all the way from Africa. But it's always the same thing when he calls, same introduction. He said, Reverend Bloom. By the way, I don't care for that. But he said, Reverend Bloom. I said, yes, this is Reverend Jim. Yes. I said, he said, I got saved reading one of your tracks. Yes. And he said, I got a church started. Yes. And he said, we become an independent man. He goes through the whole thing. He called me not about a year ago, preacher. And he said, when he got down toward the end of it, he said, we got six works going now. And then he made this statement. So on Thursday morning, we want you to preach to us. Sunday. <laughs> Thursday morning. I said, that, man, I, he said, oh, yeah, we done got it all worked out. And they had hooked up a phone line to the PA system. And uh, that Sunday morning, in particular, I was going to be out of town. I didn't want to do it in the motel at 4 o'clock in the morning, you know. So the next Sunday night or Saturday night, I was home. And so he called me about uh, 4 in the morning and after 4. He said, you ready, Rev? I said, I'm ready. He said, I'm going in to have one song, prayer. Now, I'll call you back, and when I do, it's preaching time. And Brother Lawson, they brought all six of those churches together, and I preached a Sunday morning service from my study by the phone. Now, can I say it? That's a fur piece for a country boy. And I give God the glory and credit and honor for it. But God is able, able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And I, want, I said that for two or three reasons. I want to encourage you. Don't wait till you're old and gray-headed to think you can do something for God. I am drawing more fruit 
as an older Christian off of that track, I wrote it 25. And probably anything I'm doing today. Churches have taken it now. It's in living color and color. And, and churches are using it all over the country. And God's blessing it. And I praise the Lord for it. But I'm going to tell you, do something for God while you can. Also, let me say this. I'm keeping you standing too long, maybe. But uh, back in the back, I set out a number of my books tonight. I think I have 21 or 22 books in print. A few series on CDs back there. All that goes in the radio work. As far as I know, and I'm honest, it's bigger than I am. I can't keep up with it. But as far as I know, we're broadcasting the Harvest Time broadcast at least 106 times every day. And uh, I don't know where all and who all, God keeps up with it. But he does. Amen. And uh, all of that material goes on the radio bill. Radio bill runs about $5,800 a month, $6,000 a month. You can pay any month you want to. I don't care. I wouldn't even get upset if you paid two of them. Amen. No volunteers? Well, you've got time to pray about it while we know. It. But uh, that's what it's all about. So, And I just released a new book on the cross this week. And I'm telling you, it's been exciting for me. I'll not go into that. But anyway, it's back there. Uh, the book on the home, the book of my life story, Memoirs of Mercy, is back there. My book on the Holy Spirit, which Brother Sammy Allen says is the best book that I've written. There's a book back there on advice from older preachers to younger preachers. Seven, uh, 17 preachers with 700 years of preaching experience gives advice to younger preachers. Many outline books and things. All that goes on the radio ministry. Thank you for joining us on the radio day after day. WKXV Knoxville 845. And then if you're in the general Knoxville area at uh, 15 after 9, 915, I'm on the station at Newport. I believe it's about 1470 or something like that. But it reaches over. You can pick it up in a good, good uh, part of this area around here as well if you miss the one here locally. But pray for us. Here's my, here's my heart's desire that I'm going to preach. I want to do what I can while I can. So when I cannot, I will not wish I would have when I could have. I don't want to get old and look back and live my last days saying I wish I had. I want to do what I can to get the blood of this generation off of my hands before I face him at the judgment seat of Christ. Again, thank you for being back tonight. Brother Ed and I were preaching together. Let me, can I, I preach in just a moment. Give me just a moment. Let me just set the record stake. Brother Ed and I were in the fifth or sixth cousin bracket. So I came up with this idea. When people ask me, if you kin to Brother Ed? I just say, do you like him? <laughs> and <laughs> it's amazing the looks I get out of that crowd preacher. <laughs> Nobody says, no, I don't like him. But uh, Well, uh, you know, I said, if you like him, I'm kin to him. If you don't like him, I'm far enough away from it, I don't have to claim it. <laughs> then Brother Ed, you know Brother Ed, he stole my punchline. He told that at my 50th anniversary celebration in the ministry a couple of three years ago, just before it went on to be of the Lord. But Brother Ed and I were preaching together in Cleveland one night, and he said, by the time you get through this crowd, you'll have double blue monia. Oh, some of them came this morning, as Ed would say, some people get sick of the flu, some get sick of blue. <laughs> some of them came this morning, they just got blue monia, but, but tomorrow, preacher, some of these will have double blue monia. <laughs> I'm glad I can laugh. Somebody said, I don't think you had laugh in church. I've been there when they wasn't laughing. Right. Yeah. And I like laughing a whole lot better. Amen. All right, let's read the Word of God. And again, Pastor, thank you for the privilege to be here in the service today. I am going, can I say one more thing? I'm going on to Jacksboro tomorrow at the Woodlake Baptist Church. Exit there at Carville, head toward La Follette. It's right on the left, about a couple of miles up there. I'll be there tomorrow night through Friday night in Revival. And if you'll drive up, I'll preach to you by the grace of God again. We look forward to this meeting. Second Kings chapter number 7. Let's begin reading at verse number 1. Second King chapter 7, verse number 1. The Bible said, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord, let me stop just a moment. That word Lord, you notice, begins with a small letter. 
You know what that means? It's not deity. In reality, this is a politician. He's a man, the Bible said, on whose hand the king leaned. The Bible said he answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering into the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. If we said still we die also, now therefore come and let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And they arose in the twilight to go under the camp of the Syrians, and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their camp, their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when, the lep and when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried in silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Then said they one to another, We do not well. This is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us, that I will come and that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the port of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of men, but horses tied and asses tied in the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. We'll stop our reading there. Keep your Bible open. Let's bow our heads and hearts for a moment of prayer, then the message from the Word of God for this evening. Our precious Heavenly Father, again, the Lord, tonight, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I bow before you to pray. Father, I do want to say thank you for the joy of salvation. Lord, I want to thank you again. You let me be born in America. The land of Bibles, the land of churches, the land of Christians, the land of preachers. You let me hear the gospel. You save me, dear Lord, by your grace. You call me to preach. You put me in the ministry. You have kept me there all of these years. Dear Lord, I confess gladly this evening all that I am, ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. Dear Lord, tonight as I come to this pulpit, I am fully aware of the fact that without you, I am nothing. Without the leadership of the Holy Spirit, without the power of God, my efforts are vain. But Father, I pray tonight that you'll take me, touch me, transform me, and dear Lord, talk to me and through me to the heart of this people. Do that, oh God, that you want to do. That, dear Lord, that needs to be done. Again, I acknowledge without you, I'm nothing. But you're able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Now help me to preach the preaching you want preached tonight. Use it to your glory. Do continue your blessings upon this pastor and this people. And we'll praise you and thank you for all that you do. Because I pray it in Jesus' name. For our sake I do pray. Amen. And amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Do keep your Bible open, please. This evening for the message for tonight from the Word of God. Some time ago I was in one of those. I really don't know what to describe it. Meditating times. And by the way, let me just say it this way. I wish every member knew what it was to get a message from God. They really don't come alike. Sometimes you're reading the Bible and something jumps out and there's a text. Sometimes you hear somebody else preaching or teaching or testifying and something jumps up at you. Sometimes even a song can provoke a thought. Sometimes a personal experience out in life can provoke something that causes you to study and preach. But there's sometimes preaching, I know you understand what I'm talking about, as we say here in Tennessee, just out of the blue, God just drops a thought in your mind. 
And sometimes it's more than one. Sometimes it's just one. But I, I was doing something I do not even know what I was doing. But God got my attention with a story that's before us tonight. And with that story, he connected a statement I had never thought about putting together in my life. The story in the book of Jonah. You know about the book of Jonah. Chapter number one, Jonah runs from God. Chapter two, he runs to God. Chapter three, he runs for God. But when he goes down to Nineveh and preaches, the king of Nineveh makes this statement. Who can tell if God will? There's more to it, but that's all I want to use. Who can tell if God will? Now, I want to put those two thoughts together in this story. And here's what I'm going to preach on tonight. There's no telling what God's up to. I mean, there's just no telling. It's a good place to say amen. There's no telling. Can I say it this way? If the will of God was accomplished in every life in this sanctuary tonight, there's no telling what this meeting would turn out to be. And again, I want to emphasize not because of me, not even because of the pastor, not even because it's Temple Baptist Church, but because God is God. Most of the people who are saved did not go to church the day they were saved, planning on being saved. If you were called to preach in a church service, you probably did not go to church planning on God calling you to preach. Amen. Can I say it? God has a way of sneaking in. Amen. He's God. He can do it like he wants to. And by the way, God chooses who he uses to accomplish what he purposes. I don't mind saying this, and I know the pastor doesn't mind me saying about him, but he and I are not men of God because of anything our flesh deserves. I personally believe the reason I'm a preacher is God specializes in taking nobodies. In making somebody out of them for the glory of God. Here's my burden, preacher, then I'll preach a message. I fear we have so many people that sit in our churches tonight that unknowingly have developed the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. They have a, can I say it, a split level in the church. They've got those special families and then the rest of us. And most Baptists excuse themselves and exclude themselves from God ever doing anything in their life. Here's what I want to preach on tonight. Use two words. I'm not going to do an outline. This is what I call old-fashioned preaching. This is the way they preached when I was a young preacher 50 years ago. Just preach it in story form, and that's what I want to do this evening. But I want to emphasize two things. There's no telling what God wants to do. And there's no telling who God wants to use. There's not one person in this building tonight that is excused from God using you. Having said that, I make myself clear by saying this. I am fully aware of the fact the Bible lays down qualifications for the preachers and the deacons. I'm not contradicting that at all. But I'm simply saying there's no telling who God wants to use and no telling what God wants to do. Our family grew up on a farm. I'm number eight of 12. That is a number new beginning. (laughs) I'm number eight of 12 children. They called us the dirty dozen and we were dirty most of the time. I, I didn't know it, preacher, everybody else was, but I found out after I got grown, we were so poor that it took 11 moles between the P and the R. I mean, we were poor. Unknown, unnoticed, unloved. But God, God got it in to my life. And I like it when God bets in. 
I'd like to say to you tonight, please, come on, get your head out of the sand. Quit listening to the devil's lies that you can't do anything and that God can't use you. There's no telling who. Pastor, the great preacher in the Knoxville area, 30 years from now could be a child sitting here in this service tonight. The next, and I don't mean to be putting one above another, but the next great evangelist, the next great pastor, the next great song leader, the next great missionary could be sitting right here in this service tonight. Don't rule out God's got a plan, a place, and a purpose for you. And can I say it? Stop minimizing what God can do. Stop limiting God by your own ability and let God be God and prove his ability. Can I say it this way? Stop telling God what you can't do and let God show you what he can do. The story before us is an unusual story. The very beginning of it is not very pleasant to we tender Americans. But it begins back over in chapter number six. Watch me just a moment. I'll be very brief because I know you know this. And I want to get right into the heart of the message tonight. In the Bible, we read often about a walled village. You know what that is? It's a village or city with a wall around them. The reason they built this was for protection. Could you imagine, just use your imagination, let this building become a lot larger. Let it be your home right where you're sitting. You and your family live there. And the walls around them, let's exclude the windows. But the walls are there for safety. There's an enemy's outside. And the safety of your own family is that you get inside a wall village where there are those at the door that are the keepers of the gate. There's a watchman up on the tower. And as long as they're in place and you're in that wall village, you feel safe. But there are some problems. None of those wall villages were self-sufficient. Those little things like food and water have to be brought in from the outside. Now, y'all don't like, look like you understand that. Where I come from, we like food. Amen. But they had to bring them down. So, so what the enemy did, if he wanted to conquer a town, he set up what you and I would call a blockade. The Bible calls it besieging the city. Here's what he would do. He would bring the troops in to the gates. Set them up, either destroy the man who's keeping the gates or catch him off the post, get rid of the watchman. And when they start to go out the next day, there's a blockade and you can't leave. And so they set it up until they literally starved them out. That's what happens here in Samaria. The king of Syria has come up, and it's getting bad. You really want to know how bad it's getting? I'm going somewhere. It'll take me a minute to get there. Look in your Bible at chapter 6, verse number 25. The Bible said, and there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until a horse's head was sold for four pieces, four score pieces of silver, 80 pieces of silver. Now look at me just a moment. That's not donkeys. That's donkey heads. Now, preacher, I don't want to be disrespectful, but if you're serving donkey heads after church tonight, I'm going to McDonald's. I don't care if you barbecue it, French fry it, casserole it, bake it or burn it. I don't want no donkey's head tonight. You say, why? I'm not hungry. One of the things I enjoyed when I studied this message is I realized that I had never been hungry in all my life. Oh, I fasted and prayed a little bit. I've been sometimes where I wish I could have eaten 30 minutes ago. But I've never gone to bed without food being accessible. But wait a minute, it gets worse. Not only does the Bible say, don't get shed for 80 pieces of silver, but it goes on to say, and the fourth part of a cab, they tell me that's about a half a gallon, of dove's dung. For five pieces of silver. I'm not being disrespectful, but I want to tell you again, I don't want any of that. 
I don't care if you make dressing out of it, barbecue it, fry it. I, I, I just am not in the mood for that tonight. You say, why? I'm not hungry. And then the Bible goes on to say in verse number 26, And the king of Israel was passing back on the wall, and there cried a woman and said unto him, unto him saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor? I don't want any of that either. Or out of the wine press? I don't want any of that either. Look at verse number 28. So the king, verse number 28, the rest of the, the, the Bible said, the king said, what well, then she answered and said, this woman has said unto me, give thy son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. Look at verse 29. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said to her on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. Now look at me just a moment. If that was not in the Bible, you'd have a hard time making me believe. So desperate. Two young mothers get together and agree to kill their own baby boys. One of them today, boil it and eat it, and another tomorrow. I'm going somewhere. I know this is gross, but I'm going somewhere, so stay with me. I want to emphasize again, if that was not in the Bible, I would not believe it. In my mind, I cannot fathom eating your own flesh and blood. When the king hears this, he cries out in rage. And you know who he blames? Like it is still today, the preacher, the prophet, God's people. And the king comes out with his oath that tomorrow about this time his head will be gone. I'll have him killed. Elijah finds out about it and he comes before the leaders of the city. And if you let me say that's where we're at in verse number one. And I want to read it and I want to just put it in plain language. Then Elisha said, hear you the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a measure of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Look at me just a moment. With your permission, I want to say it this way. Elijah said, tomorrow about this time, there'll be bread of plenty and cheap. I want to go to God. And by the way, what the prophet said either must come to pass or he's not a true prophet. Are you with me now? So pastor, I, I want to go to God and I want to say, God, look like you got a problem. God said, me got a problem? What is it? Your preacher just told the people tomorrow about this time there'll be bread of plenty and sheep. Even that little politician said, you've got to make windows in heaven for that to be so. But I want you to hear me. Man's problems opens up possibilities to God's greatness. Tomorrow about this time, we've got to change this whole situation. It's been going on so long, preacher. They're dying. What you going to do now, God? Well, I always get ahead of God, don't you? So I'm thinking, out, well, what would I do? A situation like this. I'll tell you what I think I would have done. First of all, I would have sought out the special forces. The troops that were well trained. Are you with me? And then I would have gone and found the educated elites who had all the ability in mind to strategize and plan out the attack on those troops out there. Can I get an amen there? Yeah. Are you thinking with me? And I would have had them devise and develop a plan whereby we could get the bread as God said to his man would be there. But one of the things I've learned about God these 52 years I've been preaching, he just don't seem to ever have to do it my way. God, what are you going to do? You know what God 
guys. Watch me now. I'm ready to preach. All that's introduction. I'm ready to preach. God doesn't go to the special forces. God doesn't go down to the elite institutions of learning and seek out men of great ability to strategize. Am I getting that word right? That's beyond me. Plan it out. God don't do it our way. Don't forget what I'm preaching to say. God is not limited to human ability and understanding. So God just simply says, back up and watch me. I'll show you how I'll handle this. I said, all right, God, let's go. You know what God does? He goes beyond the education institutions. He goes beyond the special forces and goes outside the city. Can I say it the way I want to? And finds four social rejects. Four lepers. Four people whose physical disability has been eroded by this awful disease of leprosy. Till nobody would think they could bring to pass what God had said. I want to say it again. God specializes in taking nobodies and making somebodies out of them. And God works in a mysterious way. Let me, let me borrow your attention just a moment. I, I want to step down off the stage just a moment. I don't do this often, but I want to step down here. And we got this lady sitting in here, but I'm going to pick these three men since these were men. You can sit right still. I'll be man number four. Now, we always hear it's talked about how much women talk. Well, they learned it from men. Can you imagine four men, I'm including myself in these three men. Can you imagine, here's their schedule. Get out of bed, have a bite of breakfast, and go find a place as cool as they can find, a shade to sit down till lunchtime. Now, they didn't go over there and play the quiet game either. They've discussed everything in the book. Are you with me? Are you thinking like I'm thinking? They've talked about everything that we thought of. Get up and go to lunch. Come back and sit and talk all afternoon. I mean, if it was today, it's sports, it's politicians, it's, you know, all the talk of our day. They've discussed it all. But one day, sitting there talking, can I say it? God sneaks in. And he puts a thought in one of them's mind. You know what that thought was? Why sit we here till we die? You know what I'd like to say to him? Remember fingers, hands eat off, legs, feet eat off. He's crippled. He's uh, you know, lost all of his strength. I want to say to him, what else can you do? When it gets impossible with men, it's getting now where God does the impossible. The second man speaks up and said, if we sit still here, we're going to die. The third man said, if we go back in the city, we're going to die. And the fourth man makes one of the most, can I say it, dumbest statements I've ever heard. He said, one of them said, if we sit still here, we're going to die. And the other said, if we go back in the city, we're going to die. The other said, if we sit still here, we're going to die. And that fourth man said, if we go into the host of the Syrian army, if we go into enemy territory, and I love this preacher, they said, if they spare us, we'll live. If they kill us, we will but die. What they're saying is we won't be any deader if we sit still and die. If we sit back in the city and die, uh, I will go out there and they kill us. So the decision was they had rather die giving God the chance than die doing nothing. Can I make this statement after all? If they die at the hands of the Syrians, they are no more deader Preacher, forgive me, you're passing. I've got to have somebody pick 
microphone for a moment, but at all your journey here as pastor of this church and living in this town and in the work of the ministry, you have never gone down to the mortuary and said to the funeral director, how many bodies you got? And he said five, and you said which one's the deadest? I mean, the Bible truth is if you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. You're not dead, or you're not dead, you're just dead. So these men said, if we go there, if they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we will not die. I'd rather die giving God the opportunity than to live and never know what God would have done if we just carried out what God put in our heart, our mind to do. Amazing thing is, he talked the other three guys into agreeing with him. They may not have been bad just to get four men agree that quick, but anyway, they, they agreed to go. I don't think they walked from where they were at. I mean, dragging feet and crawling, whatever they're doing. I don't think they went up through and singing victory in Jesus. I kind of got an idea they sneaked up through there. But when they come to the edge of the camp, I just like to pick, walk up, hide behind something. See anything over there? Anything? I don't see a thing. If you're about to starve and there's bread in a tin a few feet away, you don't negotiate for four hours on how you're going to get in there and get it. It's like one of them said, I don't know what you guys are going to do, but I'm going to make a dive for that tin right there. And he dives in. Bread, food, clothing, silver, and gold. And he eats all he can eat, and then he starts carrying it out and hiding it. Goes back to another tent and carries it out and hides it. You say, what's he hiding it for? I think he's looking out for himself. But wait a minute. How did he get that bread? I want you to look at your Bible at verse number 5 for just a moment. The Bible said in verse number 5, And they rose up in the twilight. Look at me just a moment. I'm going to deal with that word twilight for just a moment. I would not argue with you, but in my mind, the word twilight means it's getting dark. It could be early in the morning, morning twilight, but it generally more speaks of the evening. And I think this is in the evening here because they've been talking when we're talking through the night. Been talking. They rise up in the twilight and they leave. Oh, are you getting what I'm saying? They leave where they have been. And make a move on nothing but the thought that God has placed in their mind Amen. and in their heart. Amen. They didn't get a written letter from God. God don't write letters anymore. By the way, they didn't have a dream. I know there were times God honored dreams, but we don't function on dreams anymore. Amen. How do we know God's will? We act upon what God puts in our heart. At twilight, not knowing what they faced, but knowing it was such a huge enemy that the leaders of the city and the military could not go out and overpower them. And it was so strong of a besieging, people were dying. But at midnight, it comes to the place, if I could say this, almost, what's the use? Why wait? If we're going to do it, let's go. And they start a journey at twilight. Now, look at verse number 6. The Bible says in verse number 6, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariot, noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Now watch me just a moment. Look at verse number 7, and then we'll look at it. Verse number 7, Wherefore they arose and fled, here it is, in the twilight. Did you get it? The same moment those four lepers moved on what God put in their heart, God moved on the other end of the line and caused that army of the Syrians, can I say it, to hear what they wasn't hearing. To think something was happening that was not happening. If y'all weren't so dignified, I'd run a lamp right there. God, the same God that moved on 
four lepers now moves in the host of the Syrian army. And they start hearing what they're not hearing. You understand what I mean? They start hearing the number of horses running. A bunch of them. Chariots running. A bunch of them. Now the truth is, there are no horses running. There are no chariots running. But I don't matter to God. He can make them hear what they're not hearing. And then God made them think what wasn't right. You know what their thoughts was? That king of Israel is going down there and hired the king of the Egyptians and the king of the Hittites. And they're bringing their armies up. And if I could say it, it scared the devil out of them. You know what happened? They left everything as it was and ran for their lives. Please don't miss this statement. If God can ever get you and I to move at his bidding, even though it may look humanly impossible, God, when we make a move, God will go on the other end and make moves. And God will have everything ready and waiting when you get there. Preacher, I preached for years before I caught this. I love the study of Elijah. One of my favorite heroes in the Old Testament. I love the study of Elijah. Y'all want me to take out and preach about 40 minutes? No, I'm not going to do that. But I love the study of Elijah. One night I was preaching on Elijah. And it's one of those times preaching when something just jumps out at me. Now, I know most of you called this, but I'm slow, so I hadn't caught it. God said to Elijah, get thee hence, turn thee eastward, hide thyself by the brook Cherith. And then he said, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. You remember that story? One day, preacher, I woke up and looked at the tense of them verbs. God said, I have commanded. Now, I don't know much about English, but I know where I come from. That means God had done, went and done it. God didn't say, I will command. He said, I've already done it. When God told Elijah to go up to the widow woman's house, he said, I've already been up there and I've commanded the women to sustain me. I'm saving you when you and I move at the command of God. Can I say, God's taken care of everything that needs to be taken care of. When we move, God moves in front of us. Here they are. It's amazing. When they obey God, literally, there's no resistance from the enemy that they thought might even put them to death. They go in and eat stuff they got, and they're having a good time. Did I say it? Here comes God again. He sneaks in and put another thought in their mind. Look at verse number six, verse number nine. The Bible said then they said one to another, we do not wear. This is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. I have a message I preached in that verse for a number of years. We do not well if we do not tell. But you know what they're saying in the context of what I'm preaching tonight? It's like those three men, or four men rather, those four men, they start talking over there, their bellies full, they're carrying it out and hiding it. And one of them said, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This is a day of good tidings. And we're not doing right about it. Can I really paraphrase it to where we're at? That's just the day that the man of God said to be bread of plenty. And cheap. And we've found the bread. We've stuffed ourselves, But our families and friends back in the village are still dying. It's not enough to find the bread. We've got to spread the bread. Bread's no good. It intense. Amen. So they leave the camp of the Syrians and come back to town. Preachers, Lord, if I use my imagination a minute, I can't preach with yours. I've got to preach with mine. Can you imagine four social rejects, four lepers, 
forecast that. Just experience what I've told you thus far. If this all started at twilight, preacher, it's got to be close to midnight now. If you don't figure it out, it's dark. They don't have any gas city lights. There's a watchman at the gate. And he hears four men coming down through there, act like four drunks. You say, why do you think he acts like drunk? Everybody gets full of God, acts like drunk. You ought to try it sometime. Can you imagine that port of the city stops, dips out to stop? Can I say it? He's not seen any bread. He's not smelled any bread. He's not tasted any bread. But listen, them four had. And by the time they get through telling him about that bread and rubbing their belly, they convince him they found the bread. Matter of fact, they convince him so much it appears in the story that he joins with them and they come from the gate of the city to the porter of the king's palace compound. And there's other porters there. You know what happened over there? Here's a man, a porter, who's not seen the bread, smelled the bread, tasted the bread, but he met somebody had it and they had told it so convincingly, they convinced him to the point he is willing to talk that other fellow into it. And by the time he gets through telling what them other fellows have shared with him, preacher, he is so bold, he's willing to go in at midnight and wake up the king and tell him we found the bread. Yeah. I'm telling you, can I say what I want to say? God's pretty smart. Yeah. We're just letting me God. Amen. God don't need my ideas. He doesn't need my information. He needs my obedience. They go in, wake up the king. The famine's been so bad, most of the horses are dead. But he gives them enough horses, I believe, for two chariots. And tells them to go follow him, check it out. And they go over there from the camp and they start following him out. And they found pieces of stuff that dropped down the journey there all the way outside the area where they were in. And they come back. Now, the Bible is silent on how that bread gets brought into the gate of the city. So I'm not going to add any speculation. I'm just going to leave it there. God don't have to tell us everything anyway. But the next morning, can I do this? I'm just using my imagination. I'm reading between the lines. Here's a mother and daddy, some small children. Some of them had already died of starvation. They put a baby to bed, cries himself to sleep. Daddy and mama face the awful reality. If we don't get that boy something to eat, he may not be here tomorrow night. Preacher, they buried him already on the hillside. All of a sudden, early the next morning, there's a town crier goes through the streets of the city of Samaria. You know what he's saying? Bread of plenty and cheap at the gate of the city. Can I say, whosoever will, let him come and get some bread. Daddy and mama looks at each other. Daddy said, you stay here, Mom, with the baby. I'll go see if I can get some bread. Can I say, I'll go see if this thing, which seems like it's too good to be true, is really true. He goes, gets the bread, brings it back in. And Mama prepares it in a way that the hungry child can eat it. Not cause problems with digestive system. The little boy comes alive. That's repeated house after house, family after family. A few days go by. Maybe they're one of these little boys, this little boy I'm speaking about. And his mother's walking down the street. 
Brother Lawson, if this had been in today's society, these four men would have been on the evening news on every channel. Can I, I'm telling you, I hope you're getting a little bit of what I'm getting a whole lot of. God took four nobodies. Four unknown. Four unrecognized. Four rejects by society. And fed that whole town. Can you imagine the boys said, Mama, 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 who's them boys? They look familiar. And y'all forgive me for being what I'm saying, but they look familiar. And Mama said, that's them fellas you saw on the television the other evening on the news. They're the one. They're the one that God put a thought in their heart. They're the one that God used to get the bread to you when you were dying. But mama, I thought they were lepers. They are son. But God chooses who he uses to accomplish what he purposes. In the Bible, preacher, you know this, but lepers are a type of a sinner. <laughs> that God still saves old sinners and makes bread bearers out of them. God still saves sinners and lets them take the bread of life to a hungry, dying world and save their life not just from physical death, but from eternal death in the lake of fire and brimstone. Can I repeat, God uses who he chooses to accomplish what he purposes. But watch this, I'm closing. I repeat myself for emphasis sake. These four men didn't get a letter from God. Can I use another communication preacher? They didn't get a phone call from God saying, if you'll do this, I'll do it. No, 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 no. God put a thought in their mind. And they stepped out, obeying a simple thought that God uses. So many things I could say. Brother Ed Blue was asked to preach a revival meeting down somewhere in another state. And while I was there, a preacher, that chaplain said to him, I wonder if we could get some tape players and some cassette tapes. And God put a thought in Brother Ed's heart. And from that thought, Rock of Ages became a living reality. And if you don't like a Rock of Ages, don't come up to me and talk to me about it after service. Brother May sitting in his car one day beside of a red light, an old big 18-wheeler, just a, I think just the tractor part of it sitting up beside him, that big old diesel. And God put a thought in his heart, said, Mays, anybody trying to reach them truckers? And the truck driver's special. I stand here tonight holding in my possession the fruit of thoughts that God put in my mind. I was so backward. I'm the baby boy, three boys in our family, nine girls. And preacher, when God began to deal with me about preaching, I thought God knew a good deal. When he saw it, I offered him both my brothers. One thing I learned about God, he's stubborn. When he makes up his mind, you're not going to change it. I don't mean that disrespectful. Whoever dreamed, whoever dreamed that God, but that me, and that you have a little part in rescuing the person. 
My message, the message of God to you tonight is quit trying to limit God to your ability. Let God be God. The Irish Time broadcast literally was dropped into my lap. I closed out a meeting on the first Sunday in 2002, first Sunday of September 2002 at the Island Ford Baptist Church in Madisonville, Kentucky. And they had a radio station. They'd been talking to me about doing some things for missions on the radio. And I, like most Baptists, was too busy. I said no. I would turned it back over. The pastor had finished the Sunday morning, Sunday morning service and all the call. I went back over here on this front pew, and the pastor got up and said, "Church, I believe God wants us to give Brother Blue time on the radio to preach on missions and whatever else God wants him to." I said, "No." I went to a meeting the next week, shared it with a young pastor, and about two nights later, a preacher he got up and started raising a thousand dollars to buy recording equipment. I almost said no, but God interrupted. God said, let it alone. You don't know what I'm doing. You don't know the future. You don't know what I'm doing. Three things, just all really at one time. And with that little thought, I backed up. Ten years later, over a hundred broadcasts a day. And can I say this? God hadn't had a bit of problem paying the bills. We operate on a miracle a month, but he does it every month. He does it every month. Whoever dreamed I would have the privilege I have tonight. I'm not bragging on me. I'm trying to lift him up. Preacher, I could say this in any church in the world, but I'm preaching here tonight. I'm confident right here in this building is some folk that God's put something in your mind. And the devil has caused you to analyze it with your own thinking and your own ability. And you're sitting there with a the thought just lying dormant, going nowhere, doing nothing. Pastor Lawson, it would be interesting to hear the story. You mentioned this today. While we're having lunch 35 years ago, I believe you said you began this church 36 years ago. Am I correct there? I wish we could get him to tell us about those first thoughts of a Temple Baptist church. (laughs) Something like this would be said, me start a church. Me be used of God. But we sit here tonight 35 years plus later enjoying the obedience of a man of God and his wife. But somewhere else, somewhere else, there's a need of another pastor, another church, Another evangelist, another radio preacher, another missionary. And God's looking for somebody. What do you say about me? Don't rule it out. Let God show you what he wants to do. And if you obey him, he'll show you what he can do. Why sit we here all day? Let's stand together, please. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, our musicians are coming. <laughs> I've tried my best just to preach simple message that God laid on my heart, like the Lord wanted me to. While our musicians are coming, our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I wonder two things. I wonder, number one, are you really open for God to speak to you about doing something? Have you already turned God off and declared yourself unable? God specializes in taking nobodies and making somebodies out of them. But he does it for those that will believe and obey. Believe and obey. 
Not believe in your own ability, but believe in God's ability. Not believing in your own provisions and power, but believing in God's provisions and power. I'm asking you tonight, reckon what God might want to do with you. And I don't want you making any big step in public announcement until you're sure what God wants you to do. But if God's dealing with you about anything, anything on your heart tonight, you ought to come down here and say, Lord, I am available. Be like little Samuel say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth thee. Father, you know the need tonight. You know who's here. There's not one individual, dear Lord, that's here by accident. And nobody slipped in this building tonight without you knowing they're here. Father, you know what you want to do. I pray you speak to whom you choose to speak. Work with whom you choose to work. Oh, God, help us to be willing to attempt what looks like the impossible. Not because we have the ability, but because we know with God all things are possible. Have your way now these moments of invitation. We'll praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Our brother's going to sing for us. What are you singing, dear brother? Page 209. 209, several in the altar already here. Do you need to come tonight? Would you like to walk down here and just say, Lord, I'm available. I'm a candidate to be used of God. Whatever you want with my life, sing it, dear brother, when you're ready. Come tonight. Come tonight. Maybe a husband and wife want to come together. Be obedient to God. Be obedient to God. Yes. Yes, be obedient tonight. Wherever He leads, I'll go. Yes. 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 Someone else want to come and join these in the altar. One more verse, dear brother. One more verse. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on, God. Touch these lives. Oh, God. Yes, yes. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Yes. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Let me just say this while these are still praying. Look at me just a moment, congregation. You and the altar stand, pray as long as you want to. One afternoon in a service at Faith Baptist Camp, Brother Ed Ballou had just finished preaching, given an altar call, and the altars were about full. Always in an altar call, preacher, you know, you don't know what all takes place in the altar call unless somebody just comes and tells you. If I were standing in the podium of the campground right over here on my left, there's a small, and I'm describing him right, I'm not picking on anybody, but real bright red hair, very white, complected young boy. Gets through praying, goes back to his pew. Twenty years later, I'm preaching a mission conference in Alabama, and preacher, there's a red-headed young man. Said to me, Brother Blue, do you know who I am? And I had preached years ago when his daddy was a song leader, and them little boys just little stair steps, you know. I said, are you one of those boys? And I called the surname, and he said, yes. And he told me, he said, that afternoon I came to the altar, nine years old, and God dealt with me about being a missionary. I moderate with Brother Allen a lot there. He said, I didn't tell you, I didn't tell Brother Allen, I didn't tell my pastor who was present, I did not even tell my parents. But I told God, if that's what you want me to be, 
I'm going to shoot in that direction. He said, it's been 20 years. I'm 29 now. I'm graduating from Bible college. I'm married. I have a couple of children. And my wife and I are headed to the country of Austria right after the Soviet Union broke apart as missionaries. You don't got to tell me anything tonight. In fact, I encourage you don't make big bold steps until God's assured it in your heart. And then you ought to talk to your pastor about it. Let him pray with you about it. But you sure can make a personal move of saying, Lord, speak. I'm listening. Deal with me, oh God. Folk, I want to leave you this word. It's not a hard, unwanted task serving the Lord. It's the best thing that ever happened to me, Brother Charles, and you'd say the same. Listen, when God puts that thought in your mind, obey God. There's no telling what God wants to do. Pastor, be obedient to God. These young men still praying. Others may need to come. I just, whatever you want to do, preacher, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.